So Activision have still not released Geo's mode for Warzone yet. In what I consider to be total ignorance of the Call of Duty community, they have completely neglected this part of the player base. Anyone who wants to play with just one person has to hop into trios and just accept a big disadvantage at all times. This completely detracts from the experience, as it makes everything far harder than it needs to be. You're down on health, firepower and everything else. You're a permanent underdog. Fortunately, the only upside of this is that it makes pulling off a win in Geo's trios all the more satisfying. This video is going to be showcasing me and my partner's duos trios win in Warzone. I'll be covering our playstyle, tactics and general tips and tricks which I think are important to pulling off a win like this. Timestamps for each section of this video are in the description. The first section is landing tips. If you're going into trios as a duo, you have to just approach the mode differently. Now both of us took a hard reset, so we ended up landing at this unmarked location south of TV station that we refer to as Village. The importance of landing somewhere off the beaten track like this is that it gave us time to loot up quickly and easily. When you're playing as a duo in trios, it's much more important to have decent firepower and a full inventory. You always need to be able to be at your maximum capacity to deal damage. This is because, most of the time, you're coming up against bigger teams than yourself. The first thing you always want to be doing is farming up the cash needed for a lowdown drop. You just aren't going to be on a level playing field without perks or your favoured guns. For us, having ghosts is absolutely essential, as the majority of the time we need to drop an enemy player first just to make engagements into a 2v2, not a 3 vs 2. You'll have a hard time getting up close without ghost, which is why I swear by it. Staying off of UEVs and heartbeat sensors is never going to be not useful. Now we got rather lucky and ended up with a lowdown drop spawning in our vicinity that we could easily reach which set us up nicely for the rest of the match. Both me and my partner Insanity run growls purely because it's a horrendously overpowered gun. I'm all for using unusual guns and running with setups that are unusual as I generally find them more rewarding and fun to use but not in duos trios. There's no point placing yourself at a disadvantage on top of the fact that you're permanently a player down. Whilst it may appear a little scummy to be running such an OP weapon, realistically all it does is keep us level with everyone else doing the same thing. Section 2 of this video is movement tactics and ring tactics. Another important aspect when playing duos trios is figuring out your game plan early doors. You can see we had a promenade slash hills ring and we were a long way from any possible ending spot so we made the calculated decision to rotate extremely wide and far. We were too far out to risk pushing straight for wherever we guessed final ring would be so figured that taking a wider route would be much safer. Coming in with ring would let us come up behind players and meant we had one less direction to worry about with regards to coming across enemies by surprise. Now admittedly this was pretty time consuming and we spent about 10 minutes simply walking from one side of the map to the other but the advantage it gave us was an ideal placement for later rings which was more important overall. When it comes to getting kills as a duo you need to make the most of every advantage that you can get. During our rotation we were interrupted by the sudden appearance of not one but two full enemy teams. Now obviously we came out on top, else this video wouldn't be possible, so I'm going to break this fight down into as much detail as possible. A big play we made was making sure we didn't start shooting until we had the definitive high ground. We had enemies running away from us, they were declining down terrain which was unknowingly increasing our advantage. Shooting sooner than we did would have given away our position and we would have ended up fighting from the low ground. Plus, we needed to drop this team as fast as possible in order to deal with the next one. The first down came from the growl. You can see I picked the most exposed target possible as we needed to make the most of our surprise attack. You'll see both of us take multiple pot shots with RPGs as well, and this is for good reason. The point of these seemingly random shots is to try and finish any down players and disrupt any revives going on, whilst allowing us to stay relatively protected. RPGs have a huge blast radius, and the sound of multiple explosions is pretty intimidating. Using them between us is our best means of disrupting any enemy attempts to regroup. Next comes a full commitment and push from both of us, making sure we maximise the big advantage we have at this moment in time. This allowed us to quickly finish off this team, finishing all three of them with very little hassle or damage to either of us. At this point, both me and my teammate are quickly holding cover, in order to allow us to re-armour before tackling the next group of players. Now here you'll see me push up again, as soon as I break a player's plate. This isn't much of an advantage admittedly, but I'm at high health and know that a better opportunity is unlikely to present itself anytime soon. The enemy team also completely failed to recognise that I was flanking them, and were caught completely off guard by my sudden appearance. This is a testament both how important it is to make the most of whatever cover you have and not charging at enemies head on, but also to the importance of actually communicating with your teammates. Had the enemies called out my position, it would have been a very different outcome, but for whatever reason, they weren't expecting me from that angle, and I'm rather grateful for that. This brought us into the late game 
game, and what followed that intense engagement was more monotonous running around, flanking ring and making sure that we were always in positions of cover, just in case we happened across enemies. We also both picked up UEVs, as being able to see any exposed players late game would give us a nice edge. Plus, using a buy station in the final few rings is always incredibly risky, hence why we picked them up early. We also happened across a poor solo player who decided hopping on a mongoose at this point was a good idea. Now it goes without saying that mongooses late game are very, very risky, as being shot off them doesn't exactly take very long. Instead, what you should be doing, like we were, is sticking to cover and maintaining strong positions. Our final rings contain lots of buildings as well as covered areas, so we had to move slowly and methodically to avoid getting picked off. Both of us were constantly using heartbeat sensors and making sure to chase high ground wherever possible. This is what brought us to the final few rings. Another key bit of advice here is that you don't have to chase kills at all times. Here, you can see that me and Insanity are being heckled by other players, and I have weakened an enemy who I know is in a vulnerable position. But rather than pushing, we make a break for the high ground rooftop next to us. Sometimes, you're better off picking a good position that will serve you well for longer, rather than ricking dying just for an extra kill. From here, we again make the most of spam firing RPGs in order to deal with as much damage as possible and suppress our enemies. Having the high ground works out for us again as we can easily pick off the team who are hunting us down only a few seconds before as they are forced onto us by the ring. Now, you can see us holding our best high ground here for as long as humanly possible as we want to preserve the height advantage for as long as we can especially given we're down on numbers. This makes picking up kills much easier for us, as you can see we drop enemies who are being forced out into the open by the ring. This is where I need to hold my hands up and admit I made a major mistake. As this airstrike comes in, I panic and charge forwards into open ground. What I should have done was fall back in between the buildings in the gas itself, as I had a gas mask which would have kept me safe. As you can see, it only takes a matter of seconds before I myself am well and truly obliterated. Fortunately for me, Insanity handled the 2 versus one as expertly as any player I've ever seen, making the most of the cover the van provided, suppressing with explosives and baiting the enemy into rushing him whenever he had the cover. By constantly re-peaking different angles and chipping away at enemy health, rather than chasing a big rush finish, he pulled off the win. This gameplay is a testament as to how you should play duos trios. You need to be methodical and precise, taking your time to plan movements and kills as a pair. You need to create every advantage that you can in order to make up for the permanent numbers disadvantage you're forced to endure. Keep in mind where the ring is, how this affects player movement and how you need to react to it. Play high ground as much as possible, as this allows you to maintain a big advantage over enemy players. Duo's Trios is all about tactics and smart play style. Rushing in aimlessly simply won't help you. Hopefully, this video has been of some use to you, and has given you a handy guide as to how to pull off a win in Duo's Trios. You won't win every game you play, no matter how good you are, but if you can follow advice like this, you can only increase your chances of coming out on top.